So today, I'd like to um, give you a little bit of background on electric potential. And sometimes I'll use the word voltage interchangeably with electric potential. Okay, so first a little background and a reminder on non-conservative versus conservative forces, because this is important and lays the foundation for some of the equations that we're going to use later. Remember that non-conservative forces are things like air resistance and friction. These are dissipative forces that take energy out of systems. Usually, this energy is then lost through heat or sound or something like that to the surroundings, okay? So it's a dissipative force and it sucks energy out. Because all of these things act over the entire path of the particle and not just consideration of what the displacement is, but the total path, okay? That means that these forces are path dependent. In other words, if I were to run from point A to point B in a circuitous route where I run all the way around the neighborhood before I come back, then I've lost more to, to say friction and air resistance than if I ran just directly there in a straight line path. And this makes sense, okay? So the longer the path, the more energy is sucked out of that system due to things like friction um, and air resistance. So that's non-conservative forces. Now there's other types of forces too. Conservative forces, like gravity and the force due to electric fields, which we're going to talk about today, they don't transfer energy out of the system. They convert it from one form to another. They do that all day long, right? They convert it from potential to kinetic and vice versa. But that's a different idea than transferring it out of the system completely. Conservative forces are path independent. So, for example, if I were to take my little eraser right here and I lifted it straight up from point A to point B, right? Gravity does the same amount of work through that displacement as it does if I take it laterally and then lift it up to a height of B from point A, okay? So in that case, conservative forces are path independent, okay? So it doesn't matter how you get from point A to point B in terms of the work done by gravity or, as we'll see, the work done by electric fields on test charges. So here's an example of that. I've got electric field lines indicated in orange here pointing to the right, and there's a displacement vector, S, shown for a test charge placed in that field. This displacement vector moves it from point A to point B. But according to the amount of work done by the electric field, it doesn't matter whether we move in that straight line path from A to B or whether we take the other route, forming the base of a right triangle there, where we go from A to C to B. Okay, the electric field would do the same amount of work in both of those cases. Moving the field perpendicular to the field lines does no work for the electric field. Okay, the electric field does no work in that case. And that's because, if you remember, we have F equals QE for the force on a test charge Q in an electric field. So the force is acting in the same direction as the field lines. And so that means that if you move it laterally, right, then the displacement is going to be perpendicular to the field. And remember that forces that are perpendicular to um, their displacements do no work. Okay? So that's the case there. All right. Also, if you do a closed path, then no work is done by a conservative force. So you can imagine that that's definitely not the case for friction. If I take this spoon and rub it over my hand in a circle, friction's definitely doing work. I can feel the heat being generated, okay? Whereas if I have a, a, a particle in a field and I move it in a closed path, the electric field does no work there in net. And that's because when I move upstream to the field lines, I do the same magnitude but opposite sign of work as when I move downstream. So when you sum it all up over the path, it cancels out. And of course, as we've discussed, when you move perpendicular to the field lines, no work is done anyway. So those make no contribution to the total work, okay? All right. Now this lends itself to a discussion right now of equipotential lines. So equipotential lines are points in an electric field or lines in an electric field or shapes that are at the same potential energy, okay? So if you draw lines that are perpendicular to your electric field lines, then they will be at the same potential energy relative to the field. And so we call them equipotential lines. 
And as we'll see in just a second, equipotential lines are also at the same electric potential or voltage relative to the field. Okay? So you just draw perpendicular lines to your field and you have equipotential lines graphically. Of course, there's ways to solve for them mathematically too. Let's put a little bit more math to this. Remember that our uh, differential work, dW, is equal to the dot product of our force with our differential displacement, F dot dS. If we plug in for the force on a test charge Q in a field E, then that's QE dot dS. Now remember that the work and the change in potential energy are related to one another by a minus sign. So if we're to solve for the differential amount of potential energy change, delta U, then that would be minus QE dot dS. Basically the same as the work, but with just a minus sign out front. If we have some finite displacement from A to B, then what we should do is integrate that little differential. So our delta U would then be minus Q times the integral from A to B of E dot dS. And that would be our change of our potential energy for a charge Q moving in that electric field. Now, as you can see, this quantity right here, this delta U, depends upon the sign of the charge. If you have a positive charge, you'll have a flip in minus sign of the amount of potential energy versus a negative charge moving in the same field. And this is kind of annoying because once we have a field established, we'd like to talk about just the properties of the field without worrying about whether we have a positive or a negative charge in there. And that's why the concept of electric potential or voltage was created in the first place. Okay? Okay. So, I already said that. Sorry. So, that means that we're going to write an equation for our potential, our electric potential or voltage, related to our electric potential energy. And that equation is that the electric potential is equal to the electric potential energy, U, divided by the charge, Q. So this means that we've kind of isolated the effects of the field itself, and we're not considering what kind of charge we've placed in that field. We can just talk about its properties. Okay? It's characteristic of the field only. So if you'd like, you can think of the electric potential or voltage as being characteristic of just the field, while you consider the electric potential energy, energy to be characteristic of a charge field system. Okay? So your potential is independent of a value of Q. But it still has a lot of the same nice characteristics of an electric potential energy. Remember that one reason it's nice to move to a potential energy formulation is because then you don't have to do a lot of vector math which a lot of students really hate. So you can talk about an electric potential voltage or an electric potential energy without having the vector component. All right, so if we do that, then we can write an equation for our electric potential, which I symbolize in this lecture with the Greek letter phi. And phi here is u over q, of course, which is equal to the minus integral of e dot ds. Let's talk about units for just a second. The units of electric potential or voltage is the volt. One volt, if you think in terms of uh, phi is equal to U over Q, then a volt is a joule per coulomb because, of course, the units of potential energy are joules and the SI units of charge are coulombs. So one volt is one joule per coulomb. This also lends itself to a different way in units of expressing the electric field. We've been using from F equals QE that the electric field's units are newtons per coulomb, and that works fine. But we can also now express it in terms of um, volts per meter. So you can write an electric field um, unit as one volt per meter, which is equal to one newton per coulomb. If you've got Gaussian units and you'd like to think about those, then remember that in Gaussian units, or CGS units, here CGS stands for centimeter gram second, force is measured in dynes. One dyne is a gram centimeter per second squared. So the unit of energy is the erg. An erg is a dyne centimeter. So remember that in CGS, the units of charge are electrostatic units, okay, or ESU for short. So in CGS units, the potential difference is measured in ergs per ESU. Now remember, the difference in potential is what's a meaningful quantity. In this way, it's very similar to potential energy, which makes sense. If you think about, for example, if I let this go and drop my eraser, okay, then 
What I care about is how much of the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy as it falls. And since it's a delta U that's happening through a process, then I don't really care so much about any additive constant offset. It just subtracts out anyway, okay? So we often take the value of the potential or voltage to be zero at some convenient point in the field. And most of the time, that convenient point is infinitely far away from the source charge. For example, all of our equations, which we'll see later for electric potential, are assuming that the potential um, or voltage is zero at infinity, okay? So that's just a convenient choice that we make. However, it doesn't really matter for the problem. So if you have a problem that it's more convenient to put your potential as zero somewhere else, don't worry about it. By all means, do so. All right, let's talk about the motion of charges in electric fields and what that means in terms of changes in electric potential energy and in a voltage, okay? So here what I've shown is an electric field that points downwards, okay? So in this case, I've got a charge that I've placed in the electric field and it initially starts, say, at point A. Well, if we take a positive charge and put it in an electric field, remember that positive charges in electric fields want to move with the arrows or downstream. Okay? If you want them to move upstream, you have to push them. You have to force them to move upstream. Okay? They naturally want to move downstream. Well, if we place something like a proton, for example, in an electric field at point A and let it go, and it moves downstream, then what's happening is um, it's moving to a lower potential. Okay? So it's moving to a lower voltage. All right? So point B in this drawing is at a lower voltage or lower potential than it would be at point A. Okay, now let's think about what impact that means for the potential energy. Well, remember, if we put it at point A and let it go, it would feel a force from the electric field and it would accelerate. So that means it would gain speed and it would gain kinetic energy. Well, if it's gained kinetic energy, it's lost potential energy, okay? So, when it moves in the direction of the field, a positive charge is going to lose potential energy and lose a voltage. And if no other forces are present and you're not doing any other kind of work, it's going to speed up, okay, if it moves downstream. All right? Now let's think about what happens to a negative charge. If it's a negative charge and you place it at A, and first of all, if you just don't do anything else and you place it at A, which way is it going to want to go? Well, it's going to want to go upstream against the direction of the field lines. So remember that negative charges naturally move upstream in electric fields, okay? So first there's that. Okay, but let's say for some reason that we took it and we moved it forcibly from point A to point B. We did external work, in other words, okay? Because we'd have to to get it to move downstream. But if we did that, remember, it's still going to lose voltage because voltage is independent of the field. So moving downstream drops the voltage. However, if you take a negative charge and move it downstream in an electric field, you're gaining potential energy, okay? You're gaining potential energy, but you're still losing voltage, okay? And in order for that negative charge to move in the direction of the field, an external agent has to do the work, okay? All right, let's do an example problem based on this. Let's say that we have a proton and it has an initial speed of 1.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And then it increases its speed by accelerating through a potential difference of 0.1 kilovolt. So then what would its final speed be? All right, so let's talk through this just a little bit. Okay, we take a proton and we put it in an electric field and it accelerates. So that means it's moving in the direction of the field, okay? Well, that means that it's going to be losing voltage, okay? So it's going to drop its voltage. So its initial voltage would be, for example, 100 volts, and its final voltage would be zero, okay? So that's, that's an idea there. Next, realize that in this case, we've got only conservative forces, or at any rate, we're only told about the conservative forces, so that's all we can do in this problem. And we're not told about any other forces that might be acting on this. So we can just assume that it's only the electric field, you know, established by this potential difference that's causing this motion. Well, that means that we can set up uh, an energy conservation thing. We don't need to consider 
friction or air resistance because we weren't told to, okay? So if energy is conserved, then that means that any energy lost in potential energy would be gained by kinetic energy. So mathematically, that would mean that minus the change in potential energy equals the change in kinetic energy, or minus delta U is equal to delta K, where K is kinetic energy, okay? Now let's remember the relationship in between the potential energy and the electric potential or voltage. Remember that delta U would be equal to Q delta phi here, where phi is your voltage. Okay, so that means that we can write minus Q delta phi is equal to delta K. Now, plug in some numbers for that. The charge on a proton is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So, when we write minus Q delta phi, that would be minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times the change in the voltage, 0 minus 100 volts. When we multiply those two factors together, we get 1.602 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. That would be the amount of kinetic energy gained by that proton. Now we can set the um, equation for the change in kinetic energy, and that would be 1 half m v final squared minus v initial squared. Plugging in for the mass of a proton, which is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, I have 1 half times 1.67 times 10 to minus 27 times v final squared minus 1.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared, which is our initial speed. Now, it's just a few algebra steps, pretty simple ones, to solve for my final velocity, which ends up being 2.04 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Okay, so that's how much the speed has increased. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the gradient form of relating the electric field to the potential. We have the integral form. We know that phi is equal to minus e dot ds, the integral of minus e dot ds. Now let's assume that we have uh, a, an electric potential in three dimensions. So phi is a function of x, y, and z. Just doing the basic calculus there, that means that if we want d phi, the little change in phi, then we have to expand it in terms of the differentials of all three of those um, Cartesian coordinates. So d phi is the partial of phi with respect to x, the partial derivative of phi with respect to x times dx, plus partial phi with respect to y dy, plus partial phi with respect to z dz. So that's just from calculus, how to expand a differential. Now, this would have to equal to minus e dot ds. If you look at our integral above, phi is equal to minus the integral of e dot ds. So you could set phi equal to the integral of d phi, which means that the stuff inside the integrands has to be equal. So that means that d phi is minus e dot ds. Now, we'll take ds as a path in interval that's a differential in all three dimensions. So that means that we could write ds as x hat dx, plus y hat dy plus z hat dz, where x hat, y hat, and z hat are the unit vectors for the x, y, and z directions respectively, okay? So now if we plug into that and do just a little bit of algebra, then we can see that e sub x would have to equal to the negative partial of phi with respect to x, and e sub y would have to equal to the negative partial of phi with respect to y, and e sub z would have to equal to the negative partial of phi with respect to z. Well, if that's the case, then we can write the electric field as a gradient function. So here, I have e is equal to minus partial phi with respect to x, x hat, plus partial phi with respect to y, y hat, plus partial phi with respect to z, z hat. And that is a vector gradient, minus grad phi. Okay? Now here we can see very clearly that because the uh, electric potential and the electric field are related by that derivative, then any additive constant to the potential, any offset or change in choice of origin, will result in the same field. So really, in terms of the field that comes out of it, the differences in potential are really what matter. Let's do a simple example of this. I'm not going to do a multivariable function here. We'll talk about more of that in class, but here I'll do a simple example. In this example, the electric potential is a function of just x and is given um, by this equation where 
phi is in volts. Phi is equal to 2x cubed minus x squared plus 5x minus 12. Okay, so now the question says, find the electric field when x is equal to minus 2 meters. Okay, so here, since it's just a function of one variable, we can just do a straight up derivative of phi. And we have minus d phi dx is equal to, now taking the derivative of that function that was given there, the derivative of 2x cubed would be 6x squared. And the derivative of x squared would be 2x, the derivative of 5x would be 5, and the derivative of 12 would be 0 because it's a constant. Okay? So now, sticking all that in and putting in the negative signs where they need to be, minus d phi dx would be negative times 6x squared minus 2x plus 5. And that would give the expression for the electric field. So you can see here that the electric field is not a constant. It still depends and varies based on the coordinate. So what we'll have to do to find the electric field at x equals minus 2 meters is plug in for x is equal to minus 2. If you do that, then transferring that negative sign in, you get minus 6 times minus 2 squared plus 2 times minus 2 minus 5. When you do all that, you get minus 33 volts per meter would be the value of the electric field at that point. Let's talk just a second about what the electric potential or voltage would be for a point charge. Now remember that we can relate the electric potential to the electric field through that line integral. So we've already figured out in a previous lecture what the electric field from a point charge is, and that's kq over r squared, where k is the Coulomb constant, q is the charge, and r is the distance from the center of the charge to the point in question. This electric field points radially out for point charges and radially inward for negative point charges. So we're going to put an R hat on there to indicate the radial direction. Now, let's say that we're moving from point A to a point B there, okay? And we can move over any old path we want, DS, but remember that the change only matters in terms of the radial direction. Any contributions to the path from, um, from perpendicular parts like x hat or y hat or b hat or theta hat, that dot product will go to zero there, okay? So our ds or our dl in spherical coordinates would be dr r hat plus r d theta theta hat plus r sine theta d b b hat. But when you do the dot product between r hat and theta hat, that goes to zero, and r hat and b hat um, dot product also goes to zero. So we only have to worry about the contribution in the radial direction. So that means that our integral is d phi is equal to, delta phi is equal to, the integral from a to b of negative kq over r squared dr. Well, when we integrate that, we get minus kq times minus 1 over r, which we then evaluate from a to b. So plugging in, the change in potential from a to b would be kq times 1 over b minus 1 over a. Now, we could also do that in general for a change, for example, from position r to infinity. And if we do that, then we get the generalized expression for the potential of a point charge. And that potential at some point r distant from a point charge is kq over r. Remember here that k is the Coulomb constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. And sometimes we interchangeably write k as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught where epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, or 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Okay? All right. Now, this expression for the potential, or voltage, references the zero point as infinitely far away. We talked about equipotential lines earlier. Let's talk about what the equipotential lines would look like for a point charge. In that case, it's the distance from the point charge, center to center, that matters. And so equipotential points would be radially equally far away from the center of that point charge. That means that in 2D, if you were to draw it out, your equipotential lines would be circles, as is shown here. Okay? Of course, uh, electric field lines point off in all directions. It's not like a star that's coming out, but it's more like a... Uh, uh, a hedgehog, where all the electric field lines are pointing in all dimensions, okay? So if you were to draw that in a 3D plot, your electric potential might look more like this, okay? Now, if you have more than one point charge, it obeys superposition. 
So that means that if you wanted the potential at some point, you would have to sum up the contributions at that point from all the point charges that might be in your problem. So in that case, phi would be equal to your Coulomb constant k times the sum of qi over ri, where you're summing over all the point charges, i is equal to 1 to n, or whatever you've got. This still assumes that your potential is zero at infinity. We'll do a quick example here. In this example, we have four six microcoulomb point charges, positive ones, that are at the corners of a square, and the square is two meters on each side. So this problem asks, what's the electric potential of those charges relative to infinity at the center of the square? I've done a little sketch here. If the square is two meters on each side, okay, then that means that, of course, reference to this lower left-hand charge right here, the center of the square would be root two meters away. And that's um, seen if you consider that you're forming a right triangle here that has sides of length one meter and one meter. And then, of course, the hypotenuse of that triangle would be root two. So the distance from the center of the square, honestly, to any of these point charges would be root two meters. So now, let's go ahead and plug in. Let's solve for what the potential due to one point charge is first. I'll just call this phi one. That's kq over r. k is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth. The charge was given as six microcoulombs, which is six times 10 to the minus six coulombs. And then divided by the distance between the point, the center of the square, and the charge, which is root two meters. When you solve for this, just keeping two sig figs because you get 38 kilovolts, 38,000 volts. Now, there'd be no difference in between the potential from the lower left charge versus the potential from the one on the lower right or the upper right or the upper left. All of those would give the same potential because they're the same charge magnitude and they're the same distance from the center of the square. So, that makes summing up over all the charges pretty easy in this problem. My total potential would be four times the potential from one, or phi one. And that gives me, when I multiply 38 times four, 152 kilovolts. So that's my electric potential, all right? Now, if you have a continuous charge distribution, then your expression would look like phi is equal to the integral of your charge density rho, which could be a function of x, y, and z, times dx, dy, dz over four pi epsilon naught. So you'd have to grind through that integration for whatever charge distribution you've got. I'm going to leave that for an in-class exercise, and I'll stop there. As always, I hope you uh, learned a little something. Remember, you can pause me at any time or go back, and I'll see you in class.